and gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started with the program. I am Councillor at Large Winthrop Farwell. I am facilitating this meeting. Uh, this is an informational meeting only, it's not a political meeting. I'm not going to be giving any speeches. I'm not going to be introducing any political people. This is for you to hear from some distinguished healthcare professionals who have come down to the city to talk about 34 North Pearl Street, which was the former site of the Braintree, uh, strike that, the Braymore Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. Uh, many months ago, we had a project that was proposed and that did not meet with approval. And at that time, I promised a lot of people in Ward 1 that if I found out information about what might be done with that property, I would hold a meeting so that you would hear about it. You'd be the first to hear about it. You wouldn't read about it in the newspaper. It wouldn't go to the city council. It would come first to the neighborhood that would be affected. We do have people from all over the city here, which I think is very beneficial. And with that, I would like to read to you the bios of the people who will be speaking with you tonight. Ryan Boxel, Dr. Boxel joined Boston Medical Center Health System in the newly created role of Chief Behavioral Health Officer. In this role, he is responsible for behavioral health strategy and programming across the entire health system. As a licensed clinical psychologist, Dr. Boxel brings in-depth expertise in behavioral health from the perspective of both providers and payers. His experience spans almost 25 years working in various clinical settings in California, New York, and Massachusetts. Most recently, he served as president of behavioral health at Stewart Healthcare System, where he led the turnaround of inpatient uh, behavioral health operations. He also spent five years at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, where among his various roles, he helped develop innovative wellness solutions for Blue Cross Blue Shield Massachusetts members to reduce medical expenses from avoidable behavior-based medical conditions. He has also maintained a private practice as a clinical psychologist, so if you would just raise your hand, doctor, and we welcome you. Thank you for having me. Ramon Soto. Ramon is Director of Government Advocacy for Boston Medical Center. He is a graduate of Stonehill College and Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. He served in multiple roles in the administration of Boston Mayors Thomas Menino and Martin Walsh. He was Director of Policy for You Aspire, a nonprofit devoted to helping students acquire equal access to high quality post-secondary educational opportunities. Mr. Soto was an aide to former Senator Mike Morrissey. Bob Biggio, Senior Vice President of Facilities and Support Services. He architected the BMC Campus Redesign Transformation Project, resulting in over $25 million of annual operating savings. He also founded and led BMC's campaign to become a green hospital, resulting in over $10 million in grants and $8 million of annual energy savings. Bob is responsible for facilities, master planning, real estate, capital planning, design and construction, environmental services, preventative food pantry, environment and safety, patient transport, interpretive services, mail services, food services, operator services, public safety, and emergency preparedness. And last but not least is Dr. David Henderson. Dr. Henderson currently serves as Psychiatrist-in-Chief, Division of Psychiatry at Boston Medical Center and Professor and Chair, Department of Psycho Psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Henderson previously served as Director of the Dr. Chester M. Pierce Division of Global Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital, Director of the MGH Schizophrenia Clinical and Research Program, and Medical Director of the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma. Dr. Henderson serves as co-director of the National Institute of Mental Health Global Mental Health Clinical Research Fellowship. He has worked internationally for the past 21 years in resource-limited settings in areas impacted by mass violence, disasters, and complex emergencies. He has conducted research and training programs in Bosnia, Cambodia, East Timor, 
Ethiopia, Haiti, Liberia, New Orleans, New York, Rwanda, Peru, South Africa, and Somaliland, among other places. His work has consisted of field studies, needs assessments, mental health policy development, and strategic planning, qualitative and quantitative surveys, mental health capacity building programs for specialized and primary health professionals. He has conducted more than 30 randomized clinical tri uh, trials in severely mentally ill populations. He's directed a research training fellowship, and he mentors trainees and junior faculty. He has, uh, he has 10 psychiatry residents and four postdoctoral post fellows on data-driven international research projects. But that's not the most important. He's a 1980 graduate of Brockton High School. And he tells me years ago, he was in the jazz band, and he was up on this stage playing his trumpet for Vinnie Macrina. So, Dr. Henderson, we welcome you. And with that, I turn the program over to Mr. Sokol. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Council President Farwell, for that generous welcome. Thank you for your hospitality, and thank you for this wonderful turnout. I'd also like to thank State Representative Jerry Cassidy, who's with us today. Thank you, Representative, for participating with us. I'd also like to thank, I see Al from Senator Brady's office is also with us. Unfortunately, the Senator wasn't able to attend. He's at another uh, function, uh, committee meeting in Hanson. Um, and, uh, but Al is attending ably in his stead. So thank you for being here, Al. Um, I also want to um, thank the superintendent, as well as Jackie, for helping us out and getting us set up today. Thank you so much. Um, we are very excited to be here to present this uh, plan to you today. Um, we believe it's a very thoughtful and informed approach um, uh, to uh, utilize the, the site. Um, and with that, we'll get started. Uh, want to begin by uh, just running through uh, the uh, agenda with you. We're going to talk, uh, I, I have the easiest job here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the background of uh, Boston Medical Center health system, who we are and what we do, um, before I will then hand it off to Dr. Boxhill, who will uh, talk a little bit about the need for behavioral space um, in Massachusetts, um, the critical need. Uh, Dr. Henderson will talk about transitioning that need into opportunity uh, and, and the um, process that we arrived at the uh, Braymore site. And um, Bob is going to talk about uh, some of the specifics where it comes to the facility itself, some of the exciting things happening there. Um, Dr. Henderson will then uh, uh, wrap us up before we open up for question and answer. Um, are there any questions on the agenda? Or we can... Yes, sir. I'm just wondering if you'll have handouts or are we just seeing... We're just seeing this up on here. My, my email address is on the last slide, um, and I'd be happy to share that in following the meeting. We can't see that. Yeah, there's a little. Sure. No problem. Thank you, Jackie. Does that help? If folks you want to move up, I think certainly, we, you know, we, can accommodate, there is, there is more room up here if, if that's beneficial. Um, so let me kick us off by uh, talking a little bit about, um, again, who we are and what we do. Boston Medical Center is actually the largest safety net hospital in New England um, and the largest provider of uh, emergency and trauma services um, in New England. Um, the uh, Boston Medical Center Hospital is actually, uh, was created in uh, 1996 um, but it actually goes back, you know, some 150 years. Um, it was a uh, merger in 1996 of the Boston City Hospital with the Boston University Hospital that created Boston Medical Center. And since then, um, we have uh, have the Boston Accountable Care Organization, um, which was uh, an output of the um, ACA, which is a 100,000 member accountable care organization. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, ACOs and the Mass Health ACO, which covers um, the this section of, of, of the state. Uh, the Boston University Medical Group, which provides us with our um, our world-renowned physicians, um, 
900 plus physicians and other providers, as well as the Boston Med Medical Center Health Net Plan, which is the second largest um, health plan in Massachusetts and um, responsible for one out of five Mass Health ACO patients. Um, we're also the home of the Graken Center, which is a nationally renowned um, center for addiction treatment and education. Um, and we have a, a, a robust uh, pharmacy service as well. We're going to talk a little about who do we serve. Our, our patients are disproportionately minority, low income, and psychosocially diverse. 70% of our patients identify as people of color. 50% of our patients live at or below the federal poverty line and 50% of our health plan members have a mental health and or substance use disorder. And just by way of comparison, um, Brigham's uh, low income population uh, is closer to, 50, is actually less than 15%. We have an extensive history uh, working with community-based behavioral health services uh, to ser better serve our patients and ACO members. We have deep, deep experience running substance use disorder and psychiatric services at scale. Um, we have been um, uh, delivering telepsych to community health centers, also running one of the largest outpatient psychiatric operations in the state, uh, as well as one of the leading addiction treatment programs uh, in both inpatient and outpatient settings. We have also have a deep relationship with the city of Brockton centered around our partnership uh, through the Mass Health ACO um, and our work with Signature Healthcare at Brockton Hospital that covers approximately 20,000 lives in the region. A few examples of that work include things like community partnerships with the YMCA and Father Bills, uh, improving behavioral health outcomes through access to telehealth and care coordination. Um, that some of our ACO work, some of our non-ACO work includes running the DPH's regional recovery learning community, as well as maintaining partnerships uh, with behavioral health providers like BAMC and, and VINFEN. And so with that, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Boxel to talk a little bit more about um, the critical need for behavioral health space in the state. Thank you, Ramon. I think one of the critical things we want to mention is, I think as Ramon said, we are Boston Medical Center, but we're really a health system. It's really the Boston Medical Center health system. And as we look at our patients, we don't look at our patients as coming from the Boston region. We're a health system, as you can see. I'll speak up. We're a health system that really treats patients from across the state, not just patients from Boston. And so that's one sort of a misnomer I, I want to address. And so as you can see from the slide, we have 110,000 members in our accountable care organization. And we have three partners that we work closely with, Mercy, Signature Healthcare here in Brockton, where we have 20,000 members, and we have another 20,000 um, at South Coast Health. Next slide, please. So what we did a couple years, um, last year, was we did an assessment to say, what's really going on with our behavioral health patients? And one of the things that we see with our population is, we have a much larger behavioral health population than most Medicaid books of business. The average Medicaid book of business has about 30, 35% of their membership has behavioral health. For us across the state, we're looking at about 50%. And so one of the unfortunate things that's happened with COVID, as folks may know, is that subsequent to COVID, we've seen an exacerbation of behavioral health symptoms, which is understandable. It's a very stressful time. Folks, I know I've lost folks that are very close to me during this time. I'm sure folks in the audience have as well. And so what we found is that that's taken an already existing crisis and only made it worse. And so as we looked at our population, we saw that there is a need across the state for two things. There's an access issue in that there's a big behavioral health need here in Brockton and across the state that's not being met, but there's also a quality of care issue. And so what we've decided to do 
based on our mission is that we need to take a more proactive role in addressing that need. Hence why we've decided to enter into the space of addressing our behavioral health population by providing care that is more acute and for patients that have more complex problems. And so what I'll do now is I'll turn it over to Dr. Henderson who will really talk about the case for why we are going to get into this space or really addressing the need that communities across the state, including Brockton, are dealing with when it comes to behavioral health. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, I, I was telling my colleague that, um, you know, in, in, in the community that, that I've recently lived in, if we held one of these events, nobody would show up. So it's really impressive um, that um, uh, everybody came out this evening, and I think it's, it is really important. Um, so it's great to be back in Brockton. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a product of the Brockton school system, um, and um, I became a mental health professional. And, and, and my, I guess, mission has always been to, you know, build capacity. How do we better take care of people with mental health problems? And how do we help systems do that? And I was um, at Mass General for about 25 years. And then I moved to Boston Medical Center and, and BU, BU School of Medicine. And the moment I got there, I, I told the president of the hospital, Kate Walsh, that we really need to develop a psychiatric inpatient unit, because, unit, or not just a unit, but units, because in order to have an impact and to control the quality of care and bring the best that BMC can bring, we have to have our own facility. And the reason the BMC is, I think, special is, is, that, is that we take care of a very diverse population, but we're also an academic medical center. And that being said, we are not only responsible for taking care of patients, but we are also responsible for training the next uh, wave of healthcare professionals. Um, and, and we're also responsible for developing and, and testing the best treatment so that we can deliver the best clinical care. And so this is why I'm excited um, that we, we now have this opportunity. And so uh, with, with uh, uh, Bob Biggio, we, over the last two years, we, we've been looking for the right spot and the right place to, to, um, to develop a facility. And um, we, even just a year or so ago, we looked at a, a place down in Middleborough, um, just didn't seem right. Um, and then Bob approached us and said, have you ever heard of Brockton? And I said, <laughs> I kind of laughed, like, I think that, you know, who hasn't heard of Brockton? But I guess there are some people who haven't heard of Brockton. Um, and, and it turns out that there, there was a potential opportunity. And as you can see in the map, Brockton is strategically located. Um, we, you know, get, you know, close to Boston, close to the, you know, uh, Fall River, New Bedford, Cape Cod, um, you know, all along the South Shore. Uh, Brockton has always been uh, you know, a, a very strategic location. Um, and so um, it actually, uh, uh, when we looked at this opportunity, uh, it became clear that uh, this actually could be perfect. Um, not only could we um, help in uh, developing these inpatient units to, to take care of people with mental health problems for the whole region, um, but we can also, there would be some benefit to the community um, as well. Um, next slide. And so um, I think everybody knows this facility. You drive by it probably every day. Um, I, d I don't know how long it's, it's been vacant, but uh, it's been quite a while from what I understand. And it really um, um, is, uh, it's already zoned um, uh, for hospital use, uh, which is uh, fantastic. Um, so so uh, as we looked at it, it became clear that this would be a facility uh, that uh, would act, be absolutely perfect, and um, uh, we wouldn't have to uh, change the physical structure. We would just have to, you know, gut the inside and and and, and build a, a nice uh, um, hospital. Um, next slide. And so, what we're proposing um, is to have two um, psychiatric inpatients 
um, and uh, for acute patients. And then typically, you know, patients will come in, they come, they're screened to an emergency room, um, and then they are admitted to the hospital, and it'll be, they, they will be admitted to Boston Medical Center, so it will be Boston Medical Center. Um, and they typically stay about five to seven days. Um, and then they're discharged back to their home or their, their community uh, with outpatient follow-up care. Um, and so this is, uh, uh, I guess the slide says seven to 10 days. It, 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 it varies, but uh, as far as the length of stay, but it's anywhere from, we'll say five to 10 days. Um, and then there's a clinical stabilization uh, service, which is also a unit um, that um, is for people who have gone through substance abuse treatment and they need more time to consolidate um, their recovery. Um, it's, it's not a detox uh, facility. It's patients come, they've already been through that process and now they just need more time. They need intensive therapy um, and, and, and support um, to really con consolidate their, their recovery. And so, um, so with that, it would be a, a total of 82 beds. Um, next slide. And I think is, uh, is Bob, are you going to go through this or am I going through this? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you, you could talk through the, the facility design and everything. Good evening. So this is a, a, the floor plans that we're currently working on for the facility. Um, these are the floor plans that we're currently working on the facility. As we said, it's, it's 82 beds in total. Two-story side of the building. There are there are two inpatient units uh, that are staff. Excuse me. There are two inpatient units that are stacked over each other on the on the, uh, the two-story portion of the building, and those are the inpatient psychiatry units. And on the left side, the single-story side, if you will, uh, is where the crisis stabilization unit is. So it's three units in total, as as, as we said. Go to the next slide, please. So um, you may or may not know, BMC has worked hard uh, and has developed a re reputation nationally as one of the greenest hospitals in the United States. So we've been ranked as the top 25 greenest hospitals in the U.S. for the last four to five years running. And, you know, it, it, it may seem out of place, um, the fact that uh, uh, safety in a hospital will be ranked as a green hospital. However, you know, when I started at BMC, you know, I began my career in a community, uh, in a community hospital. And so the way I try to manage the facilities that I'm responsible for is that first and foremost, we have to be a good neighbor. And, you know, I think being a good neighbor starts with being a good steward of the, the community uh, environment in which we are, we're in. And so what we're proposing here is to have this be what we believe will be one of the first net zero for energy uh, facilities for behavioral health in the United States. Um, we, we did manage to get a $6 million donation to help us uh, meet that goal. And so we're looking at putting solar on the roof as well as doing geothermal uh, heating and cooling for the facility. Um, including that we will, even though the, the, the shell of the building will remain uh, pretty much as you see it. Um, however, clearly uh, we'll do aesthetic upgrades to the building to make it more attractive in the grounds. Um, we will also be replacing all of the windows to, to give it a to make the building envelope more energy efficient. So, uh, next slide, please. So our, our current goal, um, we have been doing work in the building primarily just uh, doing a abatement of environmental asbestos uh, within the building and demolition so that we could get a, a good understanding of the condition of the structure uh, so that our architects and engineers could commence with the design. Um, and so we expect the design will continue uh, through uh, into September and that, uh, you know, we're hopeful that in September we'll be able to begin uh, applying for a building permit uh, with the goal of trying to have the facility open by next summer. Um, but obviously that will require, uh, you know, quite a bit more input and, and you know, dialogue with folks here in Brockton. So next slide, please. So, um, oh, thank you, Bob. And so, um, 
again, there are um, uh, reasons for us to be here. Um, you know, we believe that this plant contributes uh, to the local community, um, and, but also helps to address a, a critical uh, problem in the state. As, as you may be aware, uh, I mean, we've, we've all been living through this, this pandemic. And, and, you know, we're focused on, you know, COVID and, and surviving COVID and, and so on. But, but what typically what happens is um, the, the long-term consequences of a pandemic is mental health. And, and we are in, in the middle or, or even just in the beginning of the mental health impact of the pandemic. And so prior to the pandemic, our, our state, we had, we had too few beds. We have patients who remain in emergency room for, from days on in, uh, waiting for a, a hospital bed, um, uh, but, but there are no beds available. People were boarding for you know, a week or more. Um, so there's been shortages everywhere. Um, and now with, with the pandemic, this has only been magnified. And this really resulted in the state really putting a call to, uh, to really every health facility saying, open psychiatric beds. We need psychiatric beds, uh, both child and adult and geriatrics, um, and we need these beds. And so, so this, that really pushed our hospital to, to, to become more aggressive in, in, in finding uh, this opportunity. Um, and so, so uh, the, uh, the profound need for the high quality capacity in Massachusetts, um, again, the, the facility is in a, a very a good location. Um, it's, it's right off of uh, Route 24, although the exit number has changed. It's, it's still easy on and easy off. Um, uh, we think that's um, important. Uh, we believe there'll be local uh, benefits uh, for this facility. Um, number one, there'll be uh, jobs, um, and I think that uh, we'll, we'll get into some numbers in a bit if necessary. Um, we, are, we will really um, extend our partnership with the behavioral health community, and, and it's, it's not that we, we are initiating new partnerships. These are old partnerships with us including the hospitals in Brockton, and including Brockton Multiservice. Um, and so we have always been involved in Brockton, um, and, and so, so this is really ju just a, a extending that, those collaborations. Um, as Bob pointed out, that the outside of the building uh, will not be um, altered, in, uh, so the construction um, will all be internal, so the noise will be minimal. Um, the, you know, um, there won't be a lot of um, um, high traffic in, um, as well. Um, and um, we are committed to really uh, 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 doing a, a significant investment in the landscape, really beautifying, beautification of the area. And, and as Bob pointed out also, you know, the fact that we're gonna make this a green facility um, is um, absolutely um, um, fantastic. Um, now, I do know that um, um, there, are, there are many um, health professionals that live down in this area, so this will, um, although we're, we will not be trying to um, steal people from other organizations, but it, it will create uh, um, opportunities for people who live in the community to actually work in the community, uh, maybe reduce those commutes to, to, um, to Boston as well. Um, and so now I think the next slide, we'll open it up for, um, um, questions? My name is Tom Minicello. I'm the Ward 1 School Committee person for this area. Um, thank you for coming down. The community would, um, would really appreciate if perhaps one of the, the sooner repairs uh, is a landscaper to come in and cut the lawn and tame it a bit because that lawn has looked pretty ornery for this neighborhood for a long time. Um, so we really would appreciate that. Um, and the other thing is um, security uh, and you know, diagnosis with regards to behavioral health and some patients having more severe uh, diagnoses than others. Could you just inform the community and tell us about the patients in terms of their uh, in, in the facility or wandering about? Uh, you know, how, how the safety of the community is a big concern and we need to you know, know 
what the situation will be. Please, thank you. Um, so so um, this will be a, a secure facility, so patients will not be wandering around outside. Um, of course, we will create in, in that design, you can see there's a courtyard, a secure courtyard where patients will be able to go out and get fresh air, exercise, um, and, and so on. But, but no patients will be walking around outside of, outside of the facility. Um, and, and, I, and, you know, another issue that also comes up is what happens to patients when they're ready to leave. And uh, we um, are committed to transporting patients back to where they need to go, their communities, their homes, um, you know, where, wherever their housing is. Um, the, uh, we are committed to transfer, transporting patients back to, to there. So, so, in fact, you, 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 will, you, you, you will see I think vehicles coming in and out of the driveway, but not not a very high volume because I, I estimate that there are probably you know five to seven admissions a, a day or something. So it's a pretty low volume. Um, if you think about a patient stay, you know five to ten days and and, and so on. Um, uh, but but again, uh, there, in, in addition to that, the um, facility will have its own security as well. Um, to assure that there are there are no issues. Um, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. Sure, uh, Bob. If you want to just answer the landscaping, can you just the landscaping question. What's the question? Do you think you could do a little bit? But I don't think you're looking at that site. It's been pretty bad for a long time. Yeah. So we we did. Uh, just make sure that the contractor at least starts mowing the lawn. We were made aware of the fact that I guess it hadn't been mowed in uh, a couple of years, it sounded like. Um, so we, we are making sure the lawn gets mowed you know, while we work on the design for the landscaping uh, to try and at least keep it clean. And, and you know, if, if anyone sees any issues that need to be taken care of, we can, you know, we can take care of them, so. Uh, just to piggyback on Tom's question, I don't think this is working, uh, but I think everybody can hear me. Um, what happens if they want to self-discharge? Are they allowed to do it at any time of the day? And what if they refuse your committed ride home to wherever that may be? <laughs> or if they're homeless, I know Father Bill's only keeps non-broken residents for three days. Um, so what are the plans for that? Where do they go? What happens when they want to discharge themselves and stop them unless they're ready? Um, do they get to discharge or walk out at any time of the day or night? And they don't take you up on the ride. Where are they going? In our neighborhood. I think that's where they going. <laughs> <laughs> and how do they get there? What about walk-ins, right? I mean, not everybody's going to have a ride to go ask for help, right? You know, we all get there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, are we going to have people walking through the neighborhood or up North Pearl Street to go to the... Yeah, to answer your question, I think the benefit of having a freestanding facility particularly on the inpatient side. So a couple of questions, how do patients come? All the patients that will be coming will be coming by ambulance. So there's not going to be like patients walking up, coming into the facility. Um, and in terms of discharge, patients will be discharged by their treatment team. And so from the inpatient psych side, um, a patient has to work with their treatment team to determine their discharge. It's not like a patient can get up and say, I want to leave right now and, and walk out the facility. So all those discharges will be planned. Now, to be completely transparent, on the CSS side, there is a possibility that a patient on the CSS unit may say that they want to leave. The way that a CSS is run, typically the patients that are there don't leave, even though it's not a locked unit, they're not allowed to leave the facility. And so if a patient does decide to say, I want to, to leave, we will make arrangements to make sure that that patient will be given the appropriate transportation. But again, that's going to be, I anticipate that that will be the minority of folks because two thirds of the facility are locked in patient psych, um, as a locked in patient psych facility again where people won't just be getting up and deciding they want to leave. All discharges will be planned. What yes. if they are homeless and they refuse your ride? Where do they go? That was my biggest part of that question. 
Are they Father Bill's patients who have the ability, knowledge of the system, so to speak, and the city to get in and around and walk out the door and never come back? I have a minor child. I care about her. And I know other people have children here. We all care. That's why we're asking. Absolutely. And I think that's what's really behind the question, right? Folks are concerned. You don't want people walking around the neighborhood as a concern for safety. And I think being completely transparent, there's, there's two things again. The majority of patients that come into the facility will come by ambulance and they can't leave or can't decide to self-discharge. On the CSS side, there is a possibility that a patient may say at 11 p.m., I want to leave. But I want to assure you that that would be in the minority and not the norm because for to enter into a CSS, it's not a detox where the step to get into a detox is relatively low. Right, you go into a detox. To go into a CSS, you have to make the determination that you want to work on your sobriety and you're serious about your sobriety. And so the patients that typically get into a CSS are those patients that are really committed to their sobriety. And again, I'm not gonna stand here and say it's never gonna happen because I live in a community and being completely transparent. But what I can assure you is, is that a possibility? Yes. Is it likely to happen? The answer is, it is very unlikely that that will happen. But can I stand here and say it will never happen? I can't say that. But what I will say is that it's unlikely to happen. So we're going to go there next, but I wanted you to... I'm good, thank you. are good. Okay, yeah, go, go, go right here. Sorry, I saw her, her hand. I'll come right back to you, sir. I don't need a microphone, so I'm trying to very loud. Okay. I want to know, when people go in, is this going to be like a methadone clinic? I'm just going to ask you. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So we're not going to have people coming every day for medications. That's kind of what I worry about. I happen to work near a methadone clinic, and I don't want that in my neighborhood. I've worked very hard. I, that's just my main question. Yeah, and I get that that's good, just a concern. And this is not how this, it's not a detox. It's not a, a methadone facility. I've heard some questions. Is this going to be a, a drug facility? No, this is a... a one of the things I want to address, I think there's a lot of misnomers around behavioral health. And, you know, many people, including other providers, aren't that familiar with behavioral health. It's seen as, oh, the, the scary thing. I'd say two things. Everybody in this room, at some point in their life, will meet criteria for, being a, for having a behavioral health disorder, including myself. Yeah. Everyone, right? So I think we can get that out of the way. I think, secondly, this is not a facility, you know, I think people think there's going to be psychotic killers and murderers walking around and, you know, rapists and not at all. That's not the sort of facility that we're building. This is a facility for folks that look like us in here and there's a great need. The other thing is you don't find a lot of investment in behavioral health because one, there's not a lot of providers, so it's very expensive to provide that care but the reimbursement rate is very low. And so a lot, of, a lot of organizations will say, we can't afford to make the investment. I think the one thing I like about this organization is that we've decided in a COVID environment to dump almost $30 million into a service line that we're not gonna get back. But we're doing it because it is our mission. It is something that's important to this community it's important to the state. It's probably, in my mind, the true epidemic and pandemic that's going on that existed before COVID and will most likely get worse and continue after COVID. And so that's what this is really about, being on mission and making an investment for people that look like us that's greatly needed. But to answer folks' question, this is not going to be you know, silence of the labs type murderers or those, those patients would never come to this facility in the first place. The other thing, and, I, and I'll end with this, is that being a freestanding facility, we have ultimate control over who comes in. If you have an emergency department, someone shows up in your emergency department, you don't have control. Everybody that comes into that facility will have to be screened and approved by a physician and a treatment team. So we have ultimate control as to who comes in. There's nobody that can drive up. It's not a facility where you can drive up and say, I need behavioral health care. You have to actually be screened 
in an emergency department, get approval from your insurance company, then call the physician and the treatment team at the facility, have them review the case, look at the milieu, look at the patient, how do they fit with the current milieu, to then make a decision to say, we will take this patient under these conditions. So just want to point out that since this is being recorded by Brockton Community Access, it is um, very important to utilize the microphone so that folks can be able to hear the comments and questions after the fact. So I'm just going to, just so you know. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk back about the, uh, the other part of the facility. <clears throat> we were talking about people that can leave, they can't leave and they can leave at certain times. So as I, I'm understanding that it's an aftercare, after detox, these guys, people come out and they go to extensive care in, what is it, like 20 days or whatever? Up to 28 days. 20 days. So, and it isn't a locked facility, am I correct? Right. It's not locked. Right. So I know um, that there are a lot of people that, like this lady was saying back here, that know the system, they can use it as a spin dry, they're getting out of the, you know, they're using it, they're using the system. And to get out of the, the weather, whatever it may be, you know, and I'm not trying to be cold about it, I, I, you know, uh, but they get to a place for a while and then they do want to leave. My concern is I, deliver, I live directly across the street from it. I'm the home that's going to be facing, facing the facility. We got a beautiful neighborhood. You know, it's, it, this isn't uh, uh, like a, a, an industrial type area or a, a, a fully commercial area. This is a neighborhood, and I have tremendous concern. I don't know about anybody else here, but I do. And uh, <clears throat> mental health, I know it's needed. Uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty against the, the whole thing that, uh, you know, not in my neighborhood kind of saying. I mean, I, I, if I'm bad for saying that, I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. And I do know about the, the, the what do you call it, the CSS? So it's, CSS, part of it, I'm very familiar with it without getting into it. So, I, and they can be let out and they can walk out. And if somebody's looking for something after they get out of there because they need something to get them back where they want it to be, there's this nice little neighborhood right there standing there for the pickets. And that's how I, I look at it. So, that's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, just make a a couple of comments. Um, uh, as Dr. Boxer pointed out, like these are your family members, these are your neighbors, these are your friends, these are your people you work with. Um, they're, they're people, um, and we want to provide or, or, or kind of uh, um, step into a space where there's a huge gap where people can't get the care that they need. Um, and I, I, I do respect the concern about the, the CSS and. And as, as Dr. Boxer pointed out, we will do everything we can to ensure that patients are not wandering around. We, they will be escorted back to um, their communities and so on. But, but I also have to point out is that there, there's a stigma about substance use and substance users. And, and, and I'll, I'll give you my own story. Like I, I you know, as, as a physician, as a psychiatrist, I had a stigma against people who were, who were substance users. And um, it took a family member of mine to, uh, or, for, or for me to become aware that a family member of, of mine had a substance use problem. And then once I entered third space and, and had to help, help her um, to get sober and, and so on, it, it wasn't until then that I made the shift in, in my thinking. And that, and and because people, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the the drugs got control over them. They, they, you know, there's all sorts of behaviors that we don't like uh, because they're using. But but on the flip side is that if they can get the help that they need, um, they can go on to have just normal lives like everybody else. Like my my family member is 10 years sober now, but I had to jump into that space. I had to overcome my own stigma about mental, uh, about substance use in order to help her and get and help her get the help. And I, it, was a, it was a leap for me because as a psychiatrist, 
If someone said, oh, they, they, they have something plus substitute, I'd go, oh, they need to see somebody else. I'll focus on the psychosis. I'm not going to focus on substance abuse. And I, I realized what a mistake I was making. Um, it's, you know, it's just like anything else. It, but if they don't get a shot, if we don't give them a shot, then they don't have a shot. They don't have a chance. And so we have to be able to give people a shot. And then what, what's so missing in the, in the space of substance use in this community and all, all over the state is programs like the CSS. So people detox after detox after detox, but when they come out, there's nothing for them. And so they go back to what they were doing, right? This programs give people, you've gotten through detox, now we give you a period of time where you can really consolidate what you learned and, and start living your life without the substance. And that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. But just to be clear, Terry and I do not have a stigma about the whole drug abuse, how it all works. Trust me, we're very close to it. It's not we don't have that. Well, okay? that's so yeah, we don't because we need the drug programs, we need mental health, we need all this, we need help for people. But in our small little residential safe neighborhood, we watch out for each other. We know each other's cars, their schedules. We are a very safe neighborhood. It's just concerning that if people are let in or out, they're going to come right across the street into our neighborhood. Yeah, you know, and, and, and that, we, that's all. We do that's not a have a statement. No, I, I, I to appreciate it. We, we all appreciate because that. We and we, we've, talked, people. we've talked quite a bit about this. And, and I think that we, you know, you know, we came to the conclusion that, that we will not allow that to happen. That's, you know, we have security. We have, um, we, we, we are committed to transporting individuals. If they do want to leave, we will take them to where they need to be. We will not be just letting people walk out the door. Um, and and because we know that, yeah, it's 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 a it's a very nice residential area. But I can I can assure you, like um, um, we have colleagues uh, who work at at Bournewood Hospital, which is right smack in Chestnut Hill, and the community never sees. Any, anyone, you know, but they're, they're right smack in, you know, two million, three million dollar homes all around them, and, and the community actually never never sees them. So, and Dr. So, Henderson, we just have like three or four more questions, so I want to keep it moving. Uh, this gentleman here, this lady over here, and then over here, and then I see two hands right there, okay? Good night, and thank you for your time. Uh, name is Marlon Green, and I do live in the area. I have a few questions for you, um, and I'll read them, and I'm happy to repeat them as you as you answer. So this is a 82-bed uh, proposed uh, facility. Uh, what's the capacity? Uh, what's the capacity for the uh, CSS unit? How how many beds? How many patients on that side? 26 beds. 26 beds for the CSS unit. On the CSS unit. Okay. All right. Um, you, uh, you mentioned uh, one of the benefits for this uh, facility in Brockton is jobs for local uh, residents. Could you say um, a little bit more in terms of what those jobs are, um, salary range, and what specific um, guarantees are there in place um, to ensure that these jobs do in fact go to the other residents of Brockton, or they're given uh, preferred uh, consideration. So a couple of things, and I'll I'll touch on the CSS because I think that that seems to be a lot of concern. And I'll I'll say again, what I don't want to happen is us sort of anchoring on something that's very unlikely to happen. And again, even though a CSS is not a locked unit, the way it's run is similar to a locked unit in that patients can't come and go. Once a patient comes into a CSS, they are at the unit for their complete stay. And again, to Dr. Henderson's point about you know, folks getting care, people who come to the unit will be screened. And so this isn't a matter of anyone off the street shows up and gets care in a CSS. These are folks that are gonna be very carefully vetted to make sure that they're motivated and appropriate for this level of care and can meet the expectation that once they're there, they're gonna stay for the continuum 
of that time period. Um, we also have Uber Health that will be able to transport folks at, you know, 24-7, but I just want to make that point. In terms of jobs, we're talking about anywhere between 140, 150 full-time equivalent jobs. So that may be even more if some of those positions are part-time. But in terms of 40-hour positions, the equivalent of a, about 150 jobs. The salary range runs the gambit. We have all levels all the way up to physicians that we're looking for. Now in terms of will these be jobs for the local community? Absolutely. The whole goal of building this facility is to care for folks in this area and make sure that the leadership and that the staff of the facility is representative of the patients which will also come from the area. Now, again, being completely transparent, can I sit here and say every single person in Brockton that applies will get a job? No, I can't say that, but I can say to you that there will be a preference for folks from this community. We want them to fill these positions. We want people from the community to fill these positions. In your uh, studies and research, uh, uh, where do you anticipate that the greater majority um, of your patients will come from into, into this facility in Brockton? I think it's, it's hard to say. I, I'll come back again. There is a huge need for behavioral health services across the entire state. And unfortunately, because there's such a great need for behavioral health services, there are patients that come from all over. If you look at, um, if you recall one of the slides that Dr. Hedison talked about for our ACO that had all the blue dots, what you can see is we have a lot of our members in the Brockton area, and so we anticipate obviously that we will be taking a lot of patients from this area, but also anticipate that they would be patients coming from also outside the area naturally. Okay, all right, and uh, two more. Um, Dr. Anderson, I know you, um, if I recall correctly, you have a background in research. Um, do you anticipate doing any research activities um, at this new facility? And the last question is, um, do you anticipate expanding the other services and the bed capacity of, of, of this facility at any point in the future? Yeah, great question. I, I think that, um, uh, yes, we, will we do research? Yes, because we, we need to learn how to do the job better. And so um, it, it may not be the type of research that, that people typically think about, but it, it, there will be research conducted so, so that we can understand how to get to better outcomes. And, and, and as I pointed out also, because we were training um, individuals as well, from social workers to nurses to um, psychologists and psychiatrists, um, you know, it's all about learning um, and teaching. Um, and so, so, yes, research will be a part of it, but we will use, utilize the, the data that the, that the um, facility um, collects based on just delivering care, and we'll take that data and, and turn that into um, knowledge for us, and so that we can deliver better programs, better interventions, and get to, to better outcomes. And that's, you know, I, I personally, and I think Dr. Boxer would agree, I want a continuous learning um, uh, environment where we're always trying to do it better. We're always trying to get to better outcomes for our patients. And so, so that, that's where um, uh, research uh, will be involved. Um, regarding the expansion, so we have, we have no plans to expand the size of the facility now or in the future. Um, you know, usually if you were planning to expand it in the future, you would build in that capacity into the infrastructure now. We are not building in extra capacity. We have no plans to expand it in the future. Hi, my name is Andrea Burton. I live in Ward 1D, and I wanted to know how many beds are going to be set aside for the youth. You said 82 beds. Verbally, I heard youth, but I didn't see it in the slides. Thank you, Andrea. So the facility is actually going to be focused on adults. We are applying for what's called a Class 6 license on the inpatient side, which will allow us to see 
uh, patients as young as 16. So there's the possibility to see, um, to treat 16 and 17 year olds there, but it'll be primarily 18 and above. And that, and that was really requested by the uh, Department of Mental Health. And we, we originally were saying 18 and older, and they requested that we go down to 16. It, it, it provides more flexibility because, as you know, there's although there's a bunch of child and adolescent units that are coming online in other facilities, but there's still just a huge gap. And so, so that's why we chose to do that. Hi, uh, my name is Susan Westhaver, and I'm a healthcare professional myself. But my, what I haven't heard so far is the entire facility going to be uh, related to drug and alcohol addictions, or are you having other mental health issues uh, being treated there as well? Great question. So the facility, the two 28-bed units, the, the majority of the facility, two-thirds of it, it's going to be psychiatric disorders or non-SUD diagnosis patients. It's the CSS that will be treating substance use disorder, but primarily the facility is going to be treating other mental health disorders outside of substance use disorder. So we should expect our emergency rooms, both in uh, Brockton and Good Samaritan to hopefully see some of those patients be admitted there? That would be the hope. I mean, part of bringing this facility to Brockton will be able to help to decompress a lot of the local emergency rooms that are overwhelmed across the state with behavioral health patients. Now, is there um, somebody going to be available 24-7 to, to you know, pick and choose these patients? or? It, to, to facilitate their admission into the facility? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi. My name is Paul Ware. Uh, I live on Haley Terrace with Susan. And um, just about it, I hope everybody here probably knows me because I sent out an email to everybody uh, telling them that they can, about the meeting and that they should attend. Um, and we all have a history uh, with this particular property. And so I just want to talk about that for a few seconds and uh, ask a couple of questions. And what I'd like to say is, at the risk of hopefully, hopefully not offending you, but what we're after, and hopefully you've discerned that from the questions, is real answers. Um, we don't really need to understand the, the, you know, the global ramifications of psychiatric uh, issues and all of that. What we're interested in answers about what it's going to do in the neighborhood, what it's going to do to the neighborhood, how it might affect the neighborhood. And um, again, from a background standpoint, that was, that was the main, uh, I guess, defect in uh, the previous project that was proposed for this and the way, is, the way that it was presented in the neighborhood and the way questions were answered by them uh, about what was going to happen or potentially happen to the neighborhood. So um, I've heard a conflicting, conflicting answers about the CSS unit in particular, and that is, on one hand, it's going to be a locked facility, but on the other hand, I, I just heard that. <laughs> That's what I heard. Uh, and on the other hand, I heard that patients in that facility, that, that part of the facility, can discharge themselves. I still never heard how they're going to get home if they refuse your transportation plan. So that's one question. And again, we just want a clear answer as to what could potentially happen in that particular situation where a patient says, I'm going, goodbye. I don't want your, I don't want your van, I don't want your shuttle, I'm leaving. Can they do that? And what happens to them? Okay. And the second question is, can you give us a list of the specific behavioral issues or the behavioral identifications of the people who might be treated in the other 82-bit, uh, I think it's 82, 82-bit part of the facility? So those two questions. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I think, uh, just to be, be clear, the CSS is not a locked unit, but what I'm saying is that when a patient arrives to a CSS, they don't leave the CSS. It's operated, it's similar to a locked unit in that a patient shows up, they stays for their duration. So you can stay up to a, around a month for a CSS, you show up, you stay that full month. You don't leave, go to the store, come back, you stay the entire time. And so it's, that's what it means. It's similar to a locked unit in that once patients show up, they're there until they're discharged, but they, they don't come back and forth freely. They can't sign themselves out, but that's not the question of when they want to. Can they right. leave? Follow on to that is what happens when they the decide to leave themselves, before, before and they the don't time. take your transportation. Can they just walk out, discharge themselves, walk out, and walk down the road? Yes. Yeah, at the bottom line, and again, I'm trying to be completely transparent, and the answer is yes. yes. Okay. But what I'm saying is the likelihood of that happening is very minor. It is very unlikely that that's going to happen, and I hope that we're trying to be as transparent, because that's how I operate, to be as transparent as possible. Can that happen? Absolutely. Okay. Is it likely to happen? It's unlikely to happen. But can it happen? Yes. So we do have we do have a few other folks who are already in the queue, um, and I just did want to point out just to clarify um, in terms of the bed count we talked about uh, previously. There's 56 beds for the inpatient site; those are locked units. The 26 clinical stabilization are not. It's a total of 82 beds, which is actually a decrease of the 120 formerly at the Braymore. Did you want to yeah, add to that? Uh, let me answer the second question. Thanks. And the, the second question is, uh, well, I think, what type of patients, uh, uh, what uh, disorders right. would be what treated the, at, what at the... the specific disorders that you'll be treated? Yeah, and, 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 and I think it mirrors what, what goes, ends up in emergency rooms. It's, it's, it's psychosis, different types of psychosis. It's depression, sometimes anxiety, sometimes OCD. So it's, it's pretty common uh, psychiatric disorders, but, but where people are in acute distress. Um, so, uh, schizophrenia? schizophrenia, of course, absolutely. That, 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 that's that the psychosis, psychosis covers schizophrenia, it covers bipolar disorder, de major depression. Um, you know, those those are the, 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 the typical ones. It's, a, it's it's what we see also in in the psychiatric emergency rooms. Now, there, um, uh, it, it's not a geriatric unit per se. So, so therefore, people with um, uh, who are up there in age and have uh, uh, medical and psychiatric issues would, would go to a different type type of facility. It's not a, um, um, any, uh, a, a uh, would not be a unit where uh, people with um, like autism spectrum disorder and, and like they need very, need very specific behavioral interventions, this, this would not be that type of unit. But it's really common psychiatric um, disorders. Yes, um, good evening. As an educator and listening to your presentation, I understand this to be a controlled open campus. I might be wrong. But could you elaborate a little bit more on your security system since um, I understood that you run this, you ran this in other places, is that correct? And could you uh, tell us a little bit about what percentage of the, what, what are the percentages? You keep saying that the hospitals are overwhelmed. Could you give us some statistics as to how overwhelmed are they? Um, what's happening in the hospitals that they can't deal with all these patients? All of a sudden we're overflowing with, with people with mental disorders in this area. And where have they been going up until this time since we didn't have a facility? And finally, have you people looked at any other places in Brockton that were not so residentially inhabited, uh, maybe commercial? Because I know Brockton is just bursting at the seams with open space. So could you answer a couple of those? Thank you. Um, so I'll talk a little about the security systems. I mean, I think we're going to have typical security systems you would see in a building like this. It'll be card access, you know, so people will have a their ID badges for swiping doors to get in and out of the facility as well as the different, uh, you know, rooms within the facility. 
Um, we'll have cameras both internally and externally. Sorry, I can't hear you. Are the cops going to be in there with the security for better work? We will, we will have 24-hour security inside the building. Security in addition, security guards, in addition to, to electronic systems, access control systems, we will have 24-hour security staff in the building and patrolling the exterior. Do not expect that they will be armed guards, no. So I have um, a follow-up on that. Because you keep on talking about secure facility, but if someone is psychiatrically ill, um, they can, in fact, act out in such a way that even, you know, three or four security guards can't stop them. So, you know, when you talk about the security, what type of securities do you have in place? What are your protocols if someone is schizophrenic and they are bent on leaving, whether it be bash a window or however it is that they're intending to get out, what is your authority over that person? Can you restrain them? Can you handcuff them? Can you tie them down? And once you've done that, are you going to be calling the Brockton police to assist you? I have another question. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, all of our staff um, are trained uh, to deal with situations like this. This is why, in fact, patients will be in the facility, right? This is, you know, um, um, that, that uh, you know, their, their, their mental illness is out of control. Or, you know, you, you talked about somebody with schizophrenia as an example. So. The staff is trained at first at de-escalation, but then if necessary, and we, you know, we of course would, would try to uh, minimize this, but, but, um, but, uh, but there certainly will at, at times be the need to restrain patients. And, but the staff is trained at this, um, and this, I mean, this is the expertise that we bring um, to a facility like that. And we would be having to call Brockton police, I think it would be extremely unusual. Um, as a result. How much do you pay in taxes to us? I'm sorry? How much do you pay in taxes to us? I have no idea. <laughs> well, I think we'd like to know. So we're, what I'm trying to understand is you've talked about jobs and you've talked about this, but how much money are you going to be giving to the city? Are you going to be paying full taxes? Are you going to be paying for the use of the water? What is your plan here for those kinds of ex money coming in to us as a business would generally do? So I, I don't recall the current tax rate on the building, but we are paying the taxes on the building. And it, it, uh, it, it, it's, we're leasing the building, um, and so we expect that we will continue to pay taxes while, it's, while we're leasing the building. Um, and we will pay for our utilities and water bills and so forth. How long is your lease for? Uh, it's a 15-year lease. So you've already got the in the back? So is this basically a done deal already? You guys, have, you guys are coming in. You've already been, you said you've already been doing work in there, doing the asbestos. So is this a done deal? You're just kind of like telling us what you're going to be doing already? So the work we've been, the work we've been doing is asbestos abatement. Things that would have to happen regardless, even if you were going to tear the building down, that type of work would need to, need to occur. We are here tonight to get feedback so that we can consider it as we develop the plan. Okay? Is it a done deal? I, we, we intend to build the building. I mean, we, it, it is a location that is, is permed by right, so we believe we can build the building. However, we're here to get that feedback because 
clearly it's not that cut and dry. You just can't, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time. You can't just go in, it doesn't even matter if it's a permit, right? You just can't go to any community and just start building something, okay? We want the feedback, we want to do it right. I, I, I firmly uh, meant what I said when I started my career in a community hospital. First and foremost, we must be a good neighbor. You know, and I, I, I will say that I have managed facilities with inpatient psychiatry facility multiple times in my career. They tend to be the quietest inpatient units in any building that I've managed. If you, you want to worry about like trying to subdue patients that are out of control, that happens in emergency rooms far more frequently that I've seen than it does in a behavioral health facility that's inpatient because the staff are trained and they know how to deal with that situation. And so the response of my security staff in inpatient units is far, far lower than it is in regular inpatient medical units. Hello, my name is Jamal Brathwaite, and my question is, first of all, I am very, um, I'm an advocate of, for people with mental and, and behavioral health needs, so I completely appreciate uh, what you're doing, and I also am familiar with Bournewood Health Center as well, and, and, and the design element of that facility that keeps people uh, in, even though they have access to the outdoor area. The question I have is, what other site locations were considered for this project, and can you walk this or explain the thought process of how Brockton became the preferred site location? Um, so I, I spent probably two years looking for a, a site, two to three years, I would say, looking for a site for the facility. Um, clearly the location being within the service area, as you saw on the map, where a lot of our patients was, was one of the most important criteria. Um, and so that, I think that had a large part of why we chose Brockton, right? Because uh, most of our patients are from the south, uh, south of Boston, if you will. Um, in addition, there's other criteria. You need you need a facility that, that is of the right size. It needs to be uh, convenient. Uh, in this case, it's right off the highway. Um, we wanted a location that um, had enough green space and grounds around it, right? That it wouldn't that it would be you know set back as this is off the road and not prominently on on a, on a busy street, if you will, uh, to create the right environment for the patients. And in addition, zoning is important, and, and I think you learn that through your first process with this, uh, with this facility, right? Trying to find a facility that is actually zoned for the use so that w we could propose to, to, to build the facility was an important part of the criteria. Um, we did look in Middleborough. There's a facility in Middleborough that recently sold, right? Same exact type of facility. It's an inpatient, almost identical to size. Um, that went through a community process, I think, four to five years ago, and I think the community, from what I've heard, has been pretty happy with the facility down there. And so that was one that we looked at as well. Um, however, for our patients, we felt this was a better location. So we, we have enough time for, I think, two more questions uh, before Jackie gives us the boot. Um, so this gentleman here had his hand raised, and then I'm going to go right back here before I go over to this gentleman to wrap it up. Hi, I'm Rich Moore. I'm almost 40 year resident of this area. Um, I kind of like you coming to the area, but I have a concern, and it's from what I'm hearing here, the CSS part of it. Now, I heard somebody mentioned that, you know, you're putting 30 million into the project. Well, and you're not probably getting much back from it. My suggestion is if money is not the big issue, drop the CSS issue and have all the beds for the regular behavioral health beds. Uh, because concern for the CSS is that even though you say it's going to be minimal, there's no control and like I said, neighborhood has been good for almost 40 years for me and I wanted to stay that way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, you mentioned many different types of people who are being allowed to come in and I know that you've mentioned that you're going to have a team, staff meeting type of thing to talk about them. Are you allowing sex offenders or is it all detox? addicts, and um, people who have psychosis. Yeah, so I, I, it's not a forensic facility. So to your question, they, there won't be, it's not a sex offender treatment facility. We won't have 
um, sex offenders there. Um, in terms of detox, it's, it's not a detox facility. It's for folks who have completed detox and are looking to, as, as Dr. Henderson has said, looking to focus on how to reinforce their sobriety to get sort of their feet under them. So it's, it's, it's different in terms of it's not a, and I understand there's a concern on the CSS and to answer the question about not having controls, again, I think we would not be coming here to put this facility if we thought that it was anything other than a, a major plus for the community. There are significant controls for this um, facility. Again, no one can come into the facility without being screened and being very carefully screened to enter the facility. I think to Bob's point, it's not an emergency department that patients just show up. Everybody that shows up to the facility would have to be screened and allowed. And in terms of, as a neighbor to this facility, what you're going to see is that a building that was dilapidated for several years is now significantly enhanced. It's green, it's rebuilt, and you're hardly going to see any sort of movement. You're not gonna hear anything. It's a, this facility will not be a facility where you're gonna be up at night or say, oh, I hear ambulances going by or there's a lot of traffic. It'll, from a neighbor's standpoint, you will just notice, oh, this facility that was dilapidated is now fixed up and it's a very nice facility there. Are you allowing visitors in there or is this a solely locked, even on the CSS side, excuse me, CSS side, where you're not allowing external people in who could bring something in to hurt somebody else or us? So will there be visitors? Yes, there'll be visitors. We expect that, you know, patients will have family therapy. Family therapy is an important part for folks who are going through any sort of treatment. And, you know, just like our loved ones, we might want to go visit them when they're in care. And so we would naturally offer that to folks. That's not something that we would deprive folks of having their family members and loved ones come visit them. So yes, folks will be screened, and uh, again, I, I get it. I think there's this concern that again, there's going to be some sort of danger coming in as a result, and I can assure folks that's not the case. This is well thought out. There's not going to be sort of dangerous people showing up to the facility where they can hurt folks or hurt our staff. That's not consistent with any of the facilities that, that we've run or have been a part of in the past, and we don't expect it to be a part of, of, of this facility. So we have time for one more. I just want to, um, again, thank Council President Farwell for um, uh, facilitating this opportunity for us to come to you, the community, to talk about this proposal. I want to thank Mr. Ware for also um, extending that invitation to everyone, and thank you again for being here. This is, a, a, as Dr. Henderson said, um, this is a tremendous turnout and shows how much you care about the community and we want to be a partner with you in that care for this community. With that, I want to give this gentleman here the last question. My email address is on the, the, the screen or certainly come up to me afterwards. I apologize. I'm not used to in-person things. I didn't bring business cards. It's like first meeting, I think, in like three months. So um, that being the case, I'd be happy to take your information and follow up with you with any uh, follow-up questions following this meeting. Hi, my name is Gary Keith, Sr. First of all, I'd like to thank your organization for holding this informational session for us tonight. However, there was a question asked about taxes, and you said that you'll be paying your fair share of the taxes. The question I have is, did, you, did your organization receive any incentives from the city to pick this location here in Brompton? No, we did not. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you again. We greatly appreciate you coming. You. My information is on the screen. Or just come up and give me your email. Thank you so much.